Hi guys, and welcome to tutorial on game theory. We will cover basics of game theory and it will be enough for roughly master on code forces because there aren't that many game theory problems uh, in the early stages of your competitive programming journey. So for that matter, we'll use amazing uh, resource named CSES for code submission and evaluation system. And namely their problem set. So you can do go to CSES.fi for Finland. And you will be greeted with a screen where you can go to their problem set. Let's go. Uh, somewhere down under mathematics category, you will notice several game problems. So all of these are related to game theory and we'll check them out. There are different types of games. So for example, one possible game is a stick game in which uh, we have a heap of sticks and we are given like how many in each turn each of two players that play a game can remove certain number of sticks and the number that can be removed is determined by a given set p so for example if p is equal to 1 3 4 we can remove 1 3 or 4 sticks in each turn and the question is who will win in such a game well you may notice that k is small. So from these two constraints together, we see that solutions that run in O of n times k time are completely fine. And notice that we don't only need to solve the move for given for n sticks, we need to solve the game for 1, 2, etc. sticks. So clearly this hints towards some dynamic programming where we first solve the game for one stick then for two sticks etc and then finally for n sticks <clears throat> and to do this we will apply the concept of losing and winning positions because that is exactly what we need to output you can see that we need to print uh, v if position is winning and l if position is losing or w i should say uh, so what we do is we do dynamic programming for we will for each position determine if it's losing or winning i say that position is winning if there is an edge into a losing position so we can loop over all possible moves and check if there is a move that leads to a losing position and this is essentially the concept of losing and winning positions so there is some trivial position that is losing, in our case dp of 0, when there are no sticks there cannot be moves made, so 0 is clearly a losing state, and then based on that one piece of information and set of possible moves, we define winning and losing positions as follows. A position is winning if it is possible to obtain a losing position from it. So how do we obtain? We check if we can find the number pj in set of available moves such that i minus pj is a losing state, 0 means losing, uh, then i is a winning state. So to reiterate, a position is winning if and only if there is a move that leads to a losing position. And fortunately for us, we can just enumerate all possible moves in this problem because remember, k is small. So yeah, this is how we solve this kind of problem. Just got to be careful that we can actually remove that many sticks to not go it, uh, get out of bounds. We can see that code gets accepted. Uh, so, stick game is kind of boring because I guess you can solve any game which uh, has not that many moves. 
So in that game we had like uh, all of k times n moves in total, which was fine. However, there are games in which enumerating all possible moves is not a good idea. Uh, for example, because the number of possible states of the game is too large. One of such games is Nimge, very famous, in which we have n heaps of sticks and two players. In a move, we can choose non-empty heap and remove any number of sticks from it. And we have to determine who is winning. Just to clarify, if you cannot move, if you cannot move, then you lost. So the one who made the last game, he wins the game. The, the last move, he wins the game, right? Uh, so in this problem, we are introduced to the concept of independent games because previously we had one heap of sticks, now we have n heap of heaps, and basically we, we are playing n independent games. This is a very important concept in game theory, because if you have several independent games, there is a general theory that applies, which is exactly the theory of NIMP, or sprague grandi theory, or like Grandi numbers, Nimbers, whatever you want to call them. Uh, so, Spraga Grandi theorem states the following that this game is winning if and only if the XOR of all heap sizes is uh, zero. No, actually, if XOR of all heap sizes is zero, then the game is losing for the first player and otherwise it is winning. And basically the strategy revolves around uh, making XOR zero and non-zero. So the strategy of first player, if initial XOR is non-zero, as we can see in uh, this example, five, seven, two, five, right? XOR is not zero. We can see that five XORs are at least five and seven XOR two is uh, five, right? So the strategy of the first player is to make XOR zero. One possible way to do it is uh, replace seven with two. So we will get five, two, two, five. XOR is obviously zero. Uh, the strategy here is that whatever move second player makes, the XOR will be no longer zero. So we have in, an invariant after each move of the first player, XOR is zero. After each move of the second player, XOR is non-zero. Obviously, the XOR of the final state is zero, so final state can be only reached after the move of the first player. So first player wins. And if initial XOR is zero, as in this case, then players basically change, uh, swap places, because whatever move first makes it makes XOR non zero, then second player can make XOR zero again. This is actually a good exercise to prove that a second player can make XOR zero again. So, like, imagine we have a state in which XOR is non zero. Find a move that gives you a state with zero XOR. This is a good exercise to get a grasp of uh, Grandi numbers. And I mentioned Grandi numbers because often we are, we are facing a more complicated game in which heaps and sticks are changed for something else. In this game, in this case, for each individual game, that is for each individual heap, uh, we define grand numbers, which are basically generalization of losing and winning positions. And they help us a lot. Uh, they act the same way as heap sizes. So by definition, like by property, we have that property that we want grand numbers to behave like uh, heap sizes. What it means, is that it must be possible if Grandi number of particular game is G, 
then it must be possible to make a move into games with the numbers g minus 1, g minus 2, etc. 0. And it must not be possible to make a move into a game with grand number g, right? Because then kind of nothing changes, so this is not the same as this mean, as the original mean. So we obtain from this property that a grand number of a game is essentially a max, which is minimum excludent of grand numbers of all reachable positions, which is a very famous theorem. These two facts together that a grand number of an individual game is max and grand number of several independent games combined is XOR, together they form a Sprague grand theorem or a better way, informal way to call it, I think is a max XOR theorem because it's easier to remember. So anyway. We went over a little bit of theory here. Let's check the code. We can, for this particular instance, we don't need to compute grand numbers because they are given to us in terms of heap sizes. Uh, so we just compute XOR and check if it's zero or not. However, in some problems, we need to actually come up with grand numbers. Sometimes it, they are obvious, sometimes they are not that obvious, sometimes they are completely unobvious, but we maybe don't need uh, as much from them. We'll see examples later. So in NIM game 2, we are allowed to take only one, two or three sticks from each heap. If you start writing down grand numbers for this game, and please do, I want to remind you that grand number of a game is max of game of states that are reachable from our current state. So that should be enough for you to come up with grand numbers for this game. Pause the video and work uh, your way through this exercise because it is important. Now I assume that you realized that grand numbers are remainders modulo 4, uh, which can also be computed in this uh, messy uh, bitwise way. Why is this is the case? Uh, because let's say you have zero numbers, zero sticks, then you cannot make a move. Your grand number is obviously zero. One stick you can make a move into zero so max is one two sticks you can make a move into one you can make a move into zero so your max is two three sticks once again you can make a move into zero one two so your max is three four sticks you can make a move into one two and three but you cannot make a move into zero so minimum element that is not present among those is zero and then numbers just repeat. So this is the same as saying that we take remainder model of 4. This is, can also be expressed as bitwise and v3 because 4 is the power of 2. So yeah, this is a solution to this problem. Please make sure that you understand why grand numbers are the way they are. Now let's head to the next problem, stair game. In this problem, we have several stairs numbered from one through n. Initially, each stair has some number of balls, and in one operation, we can take some stair k and move some balls from this stair to the previous stair, to the lower stair, but only to like one lower. And we need to find who who wins who wins this game. So at first it appears that this game has like too, way too many states to analyze because you can have like, there are n stairs, each stair has a gazillion balls, so that is way too much. Uh, 
maximum value of p to the power of m, this is clearly too much. So what do you do in this case? And notice that this is actually like one game, right? There are no several games involved, but you can still analyze. You can still write a program to find winning and losing positions. And this is a great thing about programming. Like when I was a kid and was doing a competitive math in high school, whenever there is a game problem on a math Olympiad, like you have to figure out winning and losing positions by hand. This is clearly not uh, fun because like even computing 20 values by hand is uh, quite a mechanical work. Fortunately for us uh, in programming, we can just write a supplementary program that will compute winning and losing positions. Or we can also write a program that will compute grand numbers for us, which is actually pretty important in some cases. And by looking at those computed numbers, we can notice some patterns. For example, in this game, once I wrote a program that checked via complete search, like just apply all possible moves to, or to every position and see if any of the resulting positions is losing. So just compute winning and losing positions. I notice that uh, stairs numbers on odd stairs, or I probably should stay, say even because they are numbered from one in this case. So numbers on even stairs, they don't matter. And what matters, let us see. And what matters is only the numbers on odd positions. No, I probably, I probably messed up. Numbers on odd positions in zero, in one, no. Numbers on odd positions in, z, in one based indexing, they don't matter. So on, uh, and all that matters is like this number, this number, this number, and this number. So we can just compute XOR values of every second number. Now you may be wondering why this works. So the way I imagine, like the way I prove it is the following. Like let's say we apply a move to certain position that is that is uh, odd, right? So let's say we move this one here. So the game becomes zero three. I believe that then we can just move this one further to the next odd position. So essentially it is always possible to preserve the XOR over two operations if one of the operations was applied to, to preserve XOR of uh, even indexed values. If one of the operations was applied to odd indexed value. However, if you apply operation to like uh, second stair, it goes into the first stair and then nothing happens. You cannot uh, like undo this operation. This is probably not a complete explanation of why this game is equivalent to NIM on only like even uh, indexed values.
Let me actually think if I can come up with a with a nice proof for that. So let's say that XOR of these values, of even indexed values, is zero. If current first player applies operation to odd indexed value, then we can undo it. I already explained. Like this one goes here, and then we just take it back, take it here. So like even indexed values did not change. So if operation is applied to odd indexed value, then we can uh, restore XOR to the zero in an obvious way. Otherwise, if operation is applied to even indexed value, then uh, just regular NIM strategy applies. So yeah, that's uh, why it is equivalent. For odd valued indices, we can undo the operation. For even indexed values, we can play a regular NIM. Um, but obviously, like it's very hard to come up with it just by thinking. You need to actually compute winning and losing positions for small cases. And this is very nice in programming to reiterate that you always can compute for small values of n, you can always compute winning and losing positions. If you are stuck on the game problem, this is the first thing that you should do. For small values, for small states of the game, compute winning and losing positions. Half of the time, there will be an obvious pattern for you to notice. Other half of the time, we will talk about it later. So let's go to the next problem. No, actually, I f first I want to go to this problem because this is this actually took me two tries instead of one, so I believe that this is easier. In this game, we have n hips and two players uh, who select non-empty set of hips, some subset, right, and remove one coin, one coin from each hip. Once again, uh, the one who makes the last move wins, and we want to find the winner. How to analyze such a game? Once again, I have no idea of the optimal strategy. So I just tried a Python program that computes winning and losing positions. And then I look at the positions, and you, if you write a similar program yourself, you will immediately notice the pattern. The pattern is that we win if and only if all values are even. Or actually, I should say second player wins if and only if all values are even. So we can just check if any of the values is odd, which once again we can do with bitwise operations. Uh, why this works? Imagine that you got some that all values you got are even, right? No matter what subset I select as the first player, let's say I select this. You can select the, si the same subset and restore the invariant that all numbers are even. So once again, we have an invariant. After... If initial... If initially all val values were even, then whatever move first player makes creates at least one odd value. So he cannot win because the final state, it's all zeros, all even numbers. And after his move, we have an invariant that there is always at least one odd number. On the contrary, uh, if second player selects the same set as first player, then he can restore the invariant. So after his move, all values will be even. So game can only end after the move of the second player. However, if initially some values are odd, 
then first player can select all odd values and make them even. So this will basically swap players. So once again, to reiterate, if all values are even, then second player can keep them even after his move. If initially there is at least one odd value, then first player can make all numbers even after his move. So this solves this problem. Finally, we have Grandis game, which is actually a game that I didn't know about, which is why I decided to recommend you go through CSES problem set. Because like literally I solved six problems, I expected them to be very basic, but there was already something that I did not know. So you can probably learn something new as well. In this game we have one hip, and we split the hip into two non-empty hips, however they must be distinct which uh, is the condition that makes this game incredibly difficult. Uh, there is no known solution in general to this game. Or I should say it's not known if sequence of grand numbers of this game is periodic eventually. Is eventually periodic. Uh, However, for small values of n, and this is something that you should notice, always notice the constraints, that n is up to 10 to the 6. For small values of n, the game can be analyzed. And I did exactly that. I wrote a Python program that analyzes the game. Let me show you. So I could have went with just losing and winning positions, but uh, I decided to write down grandi numbers. In Python, it is incredibly easy to write uh, grandi numbers <laughs> because you can define them as a function and then apply caching. Excuse me. <coughs> and also, well, how to find max in linear time, you can just loop over all values from zero to however many values you have inclusive. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so as you can see, we make a move, it decomposes the game into two independent games, so that's why we take SOR. And then we take max of all possible states that we can obtain. And this checks that states are distinct. And when we run this program, it will print some interesting values. At first values seem random. But funny thing about this number numbers when about losing states is that they appear to stop after this number. So I run that program. It didn't actually complete, but it like checked like uh, 10 to the fourth values or something like that. And it only found those numbers. So I thought, okay, maybe these are all the numbers when the second player wins. And indeed they, they, these are. So like these are the only losing positions that I was able to find. Maybe these are the only losing positions overall, but I actually don't know. So to solve this problem, we can just check if a given position is in this set or not. And this solves this game. And this is an example of pre-computation technique. If you can come up with an algorithm that solves all possible test cases, and there are not that many of them, in some time, like maybe n squared, maybe well, n squared is kind of slow, but still, like, you can come up with a way to solve the problem, it's just your way is not fast enough. It's reasonably fast, like 10 seconds or a minute, but it's not fast enough for uh, the constraints. Then 
In some cases, you can pre-compute the results for all possible cases. And then you will be able to answer in like off one time, in constant time. This is exactly what we do in our submission. We pre-computed all losing positions and we just check. Unfortunately for us, there are not that many of them. However, like there are techniques that uh, allow you to compress this uh, array a lot. So if in case you are worried about uh, source size limit, which is a sync on certain platforms, then you can compress the sync lot, like if you want to. You can replace it with differences to the next, differences will be small. Uh, for differences, you can run, run length encoding, something like that. So yeah, you can compress this array a lot if you want to. However, it was not necessary in this problem. So this is uh, really fun that I learned something new for myself. Hopefully you also learned something new. So thanks everyone for, for watching and I'll see you again tomorrow uh, with code chef starters number 37. Bye bye guys.